how do I look? Fancy. Fancy. Hey, it's Professor Jack. Welcome to Generation Geek. Today, I want to talk about Stanley Martin Lieber, who, like him or not, is probably responsible for why a lot of us comic geeks are here today. And yes, there are plenty of reasons to both like him and not. We'll get to some of those nots in a minute, but really, the entire point of this project is to bring that sense of wonder to the field. So while there are negatives to the career of Stanley Martin Lieber, we're going to focus on the positives, let you know why you should pay attention to him and what he brought to the world of comics and superheroes. Thing is, he didn't even want to be a comic book writer to start with. He did, however, want to be a writer. Born in 1922, Lieber had a typical lower income childhood. His father was born in Romania, but had emigrated to the US as a child himself. Trained as a dress cutter, the depression hit Jack Lieber hard. By the time young Stanley was 10, he had gained a younger brother, Larry, and as he says, a hell of a work ethic. Watching his father struggling to find work and his parents constantly arguing about money, Stanley learned that making sure you had a steady job and worked hard to keep it was the most important thing. The other thing Stanley had was a love of reading and a mother who doted on him. She encouraged everything he did, even loving just watching him read. So he read and he worked hard skipping grades at school, and even picking up the few odd jobs as a writer. Fate intervened when Martin Goodman, who was a magazine and comic book publisher, and also happened to be married to Stanley's cousin, arranged for the then 19-year-old to get a job working with Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, the guys who created Captain America, as a runner and general office boy. It was a match made in... Okay, it wasn't a match made anywhere. According to reports by everyone but Lieber, Lieber was enthusiastic, immature, and slightly obnoxious, playing his ocarina in the office and <laughs> This isn't to say Lieber denies any of these things. He just paints the picture a little differently, with him as the hero. This is a thing he would constantly do throughout his career and lead to some of the negatives we mentioned earlier. Eventually, though, he did get a chance to write something. See, back in the day, all those comic books needed some straight text stories without pictures to qualify for magazine rate postage. So someone had to write these stories. And in Captain America number three, that someone was Stanley Martin Lieber. Of course, since Lieber was sure he was destined to be a great novelist one day, he didn't want to waste his name on some silly comic book. So when the story was published, the byline didn't read Stanley Martin Lieber. Instead, Captain America Foils the Traitor's Revenge was written by Stan Lee. And a legend was, okay, he wasn't a legend yet, but at least the name rolled off the tongue a little better. Stan Lee started actually writing the comics themselves with a story in Captain America number five. And then when Joe Simon and Jack Kirby left, Goodman turned to 19 year old Stan Lee to take over as editor. Sure, being in the right place at the right time certainly helped. Of course, with the Second World War raging in Europe, the boys back home needed to do their part too. So Stan enlisted and went into the army, assigned to the training film division. There, he worked with all sorts of future literary luminaries, including Charles Adams and Dr. Seuss, and later in his army career, was responsible for a health safety poster. VD, not me. As he himself explains it, they must have printed a hundred trillion of those things. So in my own humble way, I think I probably won the war single-handedly because if that stopped them from getting ill, then they were all ready and set to fight. And that's the untold story of how we won the war. Thing is, while he's joking here, that kind of hyperbole of taking credit for everything is part of a pattern which would cause problems for him his entire life. When the war ended, Stan went back to the comic book company, which had many names, but we can just call it Marvel for simplicity's sake. And then, just shy of his 25th birthday, met his future wife, Joan Bucock, an English model. Like his mother, Joan proved to be an ardent supporter of Stan, filling him with confidence he might not otherwise have had. This becomes important later. Because also, after the war, the superhero game dried up. Sure, Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman are all still around, but they're characters from the competition, so we're not going to spend any time talking about them. 
Instead, Stan, under orders from Martin Goodman, is trying to keep comics at Marvel alive almost single-handedly. Goodman was a follower, so when another comic company tried romance comics, he had Stan create romance comics. Westerns and horror and teenager and whatever else was selling. So when that other comic company started bringing superheroes back in 1956, and then created a new team of heroes called the Justice League and their books were selling well, Goodman decided Marvel should try it too. He told Stan, who by this point was pretty much the only staff employee left at Marvel, to create a superhero group. And here's where the real controversy of what Stan Lee brought to the world of comics starts. Tasked with creating a new superhero group, Stan is tired. He's almost 40. He's been doing this relatively thankless job his entire adult life and still hasn't gotten around to writing that Stan Lee Lieber novel. Learning from his own father, he's worked hard and steady, but maybe now is the time to quit and go on to something else. Joan encourages him and says, why don't you do what you want to do? Create the characters you want to create. Since you're going to leave anyway, what have you got to lose? Stan agrees, calls Jack Kirby back in. Remember Jack? He's the co-creator of Captain America. And the two develop the Fantastic Four, launching the Marvel Age of Comics. These were the characters Stan had wanted to create, aimed not at seven-year-olds, but at teenagers and college students. These were characters who had personalities and personal problems, faced social issues and infighting. For the first couple of issues, they didn't even have uniforms. The team was an immediate success, notable for the amount of fan mail received. This prompted editor Stan to start putting a letters column and Stan soapbox into each comic the company published. As a creative team, Lee and Kirby were like Lennon and McCartney. For the first couple of years, everything they tried turned to gold. After the Fantastic Four, they did The Incredible Hulk, The X-Men, Daredevil, and others. When Lee brought in a second artist, Steve Ditko, the two of them created Spider-Man. And because Stan was writing all of these comics, he set them all in an area he knew, New York City. You know, I guess one person can make a difference. Enough said. Rather than make up different cities for each character, they all just lived in New York. And of course, because they all lived there, the odds of them running into each other was greatly increased. Thus, the crossover became a thing. It made sense to have characters guest starring in other books, like Spider-Man auditioning to become a member of the Fantastic Four. See, the way Stan Lee was able to write so many comics was by creating the Marvel Method. What would happen is Lee, and the artist, would talk and plot out the story. Then the artist would go away and draw it up the way they saw it and give the pages back to Lee, who would add the dialogue. Where the problem comes in is with the credit. As far as Stan was concerned, if he came up with the idea for the character, then he created it. If he added the dialogue, he wrote it. You can see where this is going, right? Kirby and Ditko rightfully wanted more credit for the plotting work they did as artists. They wanted to be known as co-creators, and Lee, he had a problem sharing. Remember, he single-handedly won the war. Furthermore, there was the public perception. What Lee did better than anything else, even better than co-creating iconic characters, which are now making companies like Marvel and Disney billions of dollars, was promote the field of comic books itself. That soapbox that Stan gave himself in the letters pages of every title the company published, it was unique and wonderful. It made Stan your friend as if he were talking directly to you each and every month. And soon, Stan's own eccentric turns of phrases like face front true believer and excelsior began to enter into the lexicon of college campuses everywhere. Sure, he mentioned all the other writers and artists, but he made sure that he was the guy you were listening to. While there had been fan clubs for characters dating all the way back to the beginning of the industry, Captain America had the Sentinels of Liberty, Stan created fan clubs for the company itself. Why be a Spider-Man fan when instead you could join FOOM, the fans of old Marvel? Or even better, the Merry Marvel Marching Society. You belong, you belong, you belong, you belong to the Merry Marvel Marching Society. March along, march along, march along to the song of the Merry Marvel Marching Society. The column asked Chris in the Comics Alliance put it best when he said, by getting out there, by making himself the focus, he became as much of a character, as much of a product as the comics. 
He was a marketable commodity and he sold very well. This is why in the 60s and 70s, he toured university campuses and spread the gospel of comic books. And when he was interviewed in the press, his charming personality led reporters to hand him the bulk of the credit for the creation of these characters, even characters he had nothing to do with, and Stan did relatively little to dissuade them. Even the company stood behind this fiction. So even when Stan would demure and say, no, 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 there was always the feeling he was just saying it to be polite. This is why he moved to Los Angeles in the 80s to try and get the characters he controlled into TV and movies. And when technology finally caught up to the visual style portrayed by Kirby in books like the X-Men and could be shown on the screen, Stan was invited to make an appearance, a nod to the fans. And then as the MCU came into existence with Iron Man, it became a thing to look for the Stan Lee cameo. And Lee, once again, reaffirmed his status as the face of comic books, the man behind the superhero. So sure, there were some questionable practices and maybe a bit of ego did, in fact, get in the way. But Stan Lee made comic books accessible to and for everyone. The list of characters he legitimately had a hand in creating is huge and iconic. And he's even given us a popular phrase from way back in Amazing Stories number 15, the first appearance of Spider-Man where Lee, in the voice of the narrator, intones that, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Like him or hate him, there's no denying the importance Stan Lee has had on the comic books we all know and love. I'm Professor Jack. Thanks for joining Generation Geek. If you like what you just saw, Remember to hit the subscribe button and click for notifications so that you'll know every time Generation Geek has a new video out. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. We're there. And if you want to meet us in person, come check out Comic-Con Baltics this year. We'll see you there. And if you like my bow ties, handsome hobo neckwear, find them on Etsy.